Hey, what's going on everyone? Hope you're having a great day so far today. Uh, today we're going to go over the Attack of the Clones bonus disc. This is part two and I'm going to start structuring them uh, as like 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, which two would fall under episode two, 3.1, episode three, four, and so on and so forth. Uh, before we get started, this is going to be a fun video. Usually these are going to be edited, but I just wanted to go live with you guys. I didn't do this last night, so I was like, you know what? Let me just interact with the community. Let's have some fun. Um, a project, before we begin, a project uh, that I worked on over a year ago called Chalk Warfare 4 has just released today. And it's 16 minutes long. It's super fun. I'm going to show you guys my scene with Jamie Costa, and then you guys can go watch the rest if you want, and then we'll get started. So, uh, without further ado, here you go. Let's check it out. Action, Dom! Stay right there! Okay, let's hold on that. Take him together, Dom. May the force be with you! Dom! And there it is. Okay, um, let's begin. This is, we're starting off where we left off last time. So we left off on part four, uh, which is Hayden Christensen. So let's get started. And someday, I'm gonna fly away from this place. You think I'm still the little boy that you first met? When the truth is, I've changed. I'm grown up. So this one's gonna be much more interactive with chat. Whenever you're okay, I'm sure. casting, first of all, you're always looking for a really good actor, somebody that really has a lot of craft and is really very talented. And Action! Who fits the part that you've created. For the role of Anakin, we um, had a formal screen test. 102 take one, Mark. And to be honest, I went in with no expectations. I really wasn't thinking that, you know, ooh, I really want this part. It was just, wow, you know, that's George Lucas. This is cool. Oh! And in this particular case, I was looking for somebody who was very boyish and young, but had sort of a James Dean, sullen edge to him. Annie. Anakin. Annie makes me sound like a little boy. You look at those eyes, and there's just so much happening there. Hayden had all the elements of the character. I try to grow up too fast. I am grown up. About a week a after my man. test, not even, I was lying in bed and got the phone call that I got the part. I never would have expected to be here right now. This is Star Wars. It's really, really cool. This is my first action. Hayden's uh, stepping into a huge part to play Anakin and to be the young Darth Vader, you know? Yeah, they're liking me today. I was always the youngest one, and um, I'm now not, so... So, uh, <laughs> it's funny, the first day I, I had to take my lightsaber out and set, I didn't even realize what I was doing, and I, the first take I did, I was like, wow, wow, I was like, oh, no, you guys, you'll put that in later, won't you? I don't want to be, you know, showing him how things are, because everyone has to find out for themselves. He's brilliant, I love him to death, he's a great kid. Anakin in this movie is a transitional character. He's going from the young Padawan learner to becoming aware of the fact there's more to him than that. He's always had a sense of longing for love in his life. Mm. Hayden's a wonderful <laughs> actor. I'm really, really impressed by him, especially because he's very confident. And he's a much more complex character than the surface uh, belies. It's not really a mystery. Everyone knows that I'm going to the dark side. It's kind of like the Titanic sinking. Can you excuse me for just a moment? <laughs> well, for me, it's it's just heaps of fun to go in and, and get dressed up as a Jedi every day and put on the boots and get to wear the cloak occasionally. Great. He's got a fantastic mind. He understands exactly the part. Got that Every down. stunt he's got, got on this like movie, he he'll do it. We have a yeah. double, we have a good double. Hayden's actually too good, and I'm not <laughs> really doing very much at all. I mean, he's fiercer than the double, and, you know, he's made out of 
tough stuff. I was heavily involved in athletics and wanted to be a hockey player, wanted to be a tennis player. It's Star Wars, you know? Why would you not want to be a part of every aspect that you could? I don't want anyone else on the screen trying to do my thing. You know, I'll take a few bruises for the team. It's a stuntman in me. As much as it is my character, it's all coming from George's head. He is the definitive uh, of how it should be played. So you have to pay attention. Well, Hayden is actually a very talented actor. He's very good and very professional. Works really hard. Mm. He shouldn't have gotten the hate that he got, man. It's just not it's right. Extraordinary to think right. That he's so young. People just don't understand the character. I had no idea. You try to give flashes of, of, of darkness and flashes of just pure innocence just to try to bring everything together. He was able to pull that off very well. And it was a hard thing to do. Giving yourself to the Jedi means giving your whole life. <coughs> Look <laughs> at that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's cool, man. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand how much he actually put into the role in the sense that you can even see, and I made a video about this, you can see with his cadence as, Va as Anakin, he tries to make sure that he sounds like um, James Earl Jones as Vader. So when he says things like, yes, my master, that's why he sounds so... Um, monotone, right? That's the whole point behind it. He knew what he was doing, but regular fans couldn't understand that. So they, you know, just give him a lot of hate for nothing. So let's go on the next one. A Twinkle Beyond Pluto. Extras fill out the Star Wars galaxy. And then uh, after that, we'll continue on with that as well. After that one. Oh, here we go. In Star Wars, in any of the episodes that we're making, extras are extraordinarily important in defining the place that we're at. To, you know, have people understand that there was another world there. I, I don't know how we ended up here. And where planet are you from? Uh, it's Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> there are sequences in Star Wars like the Cantina where I think that's certainly my favorite sequence, and that's entirely made up of extras, and it turned out to be one of the best in the whole saga. Extras seem to have very high self-esteem, I think, because they're put through so much during the day. They're herded around like cattle. Get on the bus! Get on the bus! <laughs> they don't do anything for hours at a time, so you have to really feel good about yourself. I'm a spaceman, but a very important spaceman. <laughs> As an ordinary extra, I say, you're not a star, but you're a, a twinkle beyond Pluto. Can we boogie? <laughs> the response for Star Wars has been like no other production I've ever worked on. Because people know it and they love it and they're dedicated to it and they're fans. It's so different working on a project that has um, so much history. The Ewoks. The Ewoks. Yeah. Why did you remember that one? Oh, because I didn't get the part. <laughs> I've seen every Star Wars film in the first week it was out, and I just can't believe I'm here. Stroke of luck, really. The Force was with us. <laughs> I know. The reaction, particularly with younger people, when you just casually mention, oh, I've done a couple of days in Star Wars. Star Wars! I know, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'm getting ready for my part as an intergalactic backpacker. You're all normal pedestrian. An extra is someone who is in the background of a scene who has no dialogue but may have a little bit of business. You go in the direction I told you to go as I walked along the side. You're an animated body. An animated body, a <laughs> screen filler. <laughs> so folks, just pick it up a bit, just be a bit animated. Just because you're in space doesn't mean that you can't have fun. You'll see that this is actually all fogged up, so it's impossible to see out of any of this. But I mean, that's the fun of acting, really, isn't it? <laughs> we actually don't need an acting ability. You're always going to be doing the same thing. What we need is a look. Basically, what we want to do is try and fit the oh, faces man. of the particular extras into um, costumes which would suit their own little characters. You sort of can't just have Youngling. a costume allotted for people because we're getting all different shapes and sizes. <laughs> Jedi don't have to see. <laughs> when you finish your schooling, you'll look like Ewan McGregor. Lots of facial hair, tall. Everybody falls for the strong sign. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I get it. That's you, right? <laughs> Yeah! Every creature and every extra that you see in 
each movie has a name, has a personality, um, has a backstory. They are some sort of being that has actually been given a life. There's one in um, cool. episode two. His name is Kit Fisto. Just an extra, a guy, but all of a sudden, like, put in his name, and now there's the story there. Like, you want to know something about him. I love it. Shoot it. When this goes on, I'm a totally different person. <laughs> I'm female. It's easy. We have a sequence in episode two where we're in a nightclub. Yo, we got a really good date for you. Surprise. I fixed you up. Put your arm around Tony here. <laughs> there you go. Oh, it's man. a very classic Western type of barroom scene where the doors fly open and the two gunslingers walk in. We needed about 150 extras. There had to be a certain look to them. I've never looked like this before. I have been airbrushed all over. It's a place that's in the lower depths of, of Curacao, a place that we actually haven't really seen before. There is one thing worse than working with me, it's being an extra in a Star Wars movie, it's okay. <laughs> and I, I would that debate that. So when we come around to that second position. And you have a great first assistant director um, who can move his extras around. Ah, oh, it's fantastic. Everyone take a step to their right. There's two rules. First rule is, I don't care what you do. I don't care where you go. I don't care if you need to buy a paper, go to the bathroom, whatever. But the second rule is, you've got to tell me you're going to do it. You guys just stepped off set. What happened? Stand-ins are slightly higher in status than, than extras. Perhaps when you're standing in the queue at lunchtime, you, you can stand in front of someone who's an extra. We are indebted to you for your bravery, Obi-Wan Kenobi. In episode one, there's a scene, a particularly beautiful, haunting, dramatic scene, where there are two um, extras who I think basically define what extra acting is all about. Congratulations on your election, Chancellor. That happens to be Ben Burton myself in this sequence. <laughs> Classic example for anyone that uh, anyone can be an extra, but they can do it a lot better than seconds. we did. That's Thank you crazy. guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. It would have been so cool to be an extra on Star Wars, man. Just imagine if you're like, yeah, I was in the prequels. I was in the originals. Uh, what's going on with you guys? Oh, 2,500 of you. Thank you so much for joining, guys. Um, let's go to number six. It's all magic. Visual effects wizard restarts on the set. And then after that, we'll go on to number seven, which will be a different panel. Uh, Charlie says, in honor of this video, thanks for making that video a few years back about Hayden. He did not deserve all that BS hate. You rock theory. Thanks, Charlie. I totally agree, man. If you haven't seen that video, go watch that video on why Hayden Christensen played Anakin perfectly. Let's begin. Uh, when I did Star Wars, it's the whole project was an exercise in reining myself in and designing a film to be able to get the maximum amount of strange environment and exciting spaceship action out of very, very little. I don't really have to rein myself in anymore. Welcome to episode two. Uh, <laughs> Roll, please. Action! I would say over half the sets are, are digitally created. That was great. It's, it's in essence a digital movie, so that ILM is really working on every single shot. And General George doesn't limit his thinking to what he knows can be done with the technology. He always tries to set the bar a little higher, and it's up to us to try and figure out, well, can that actually be executed? You know, film is a very collaborative medium. The ILM group is just part of the team, and uh, they're able to tell me what they can and can't do. You are the ones that has to deal with the overall picture. I'm, for the visual effects, acting as the DP. So I'm concerned primarily with the technical and aesthetic issues of, uh, of putting the shots together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rob is kind of the, the actors. George will direct so cool. Rob, and Rob will pass that on to Palpatine's office. We are no longer safe under their protection. Perfect. Thank okay, print the last one. Be sure, that, be sure that the animation department gets that piece. <laughs> and that's how we do it. No matter what you do in motion picture medium, it's, a, it's an exercise in utilizing resources and technology. And the sphere is always this object of mystery. People want to know what is it, what the hell are you doing? Uh, it's a way of sampling lighting in a particular location to see how the whole scene is illuminated. 
Whenever we're doing a digital character, we always do a block through with the voice actor and Ewan in this case, so that they can get the timing and pacing and where their eye lines are. I don't care about these stinky eye lines. <laughs> Who cares about eye lines? And then we take the voice actor away, and uh, he has to do the scene, pantomimes the scene. That the guy who's creating that character will create their responses off of what, how you respond to their responses that aren't there. It's a nightmare. That'll do nicely. As we're setting up to shoot a shot, I try and project myself uh, down the line. How are we going to actually execute this shot? Flash. Uh, the effects is measuring, like the most uh, the difficult things height, when it comes to, to movies, man. It turns out uh, later on we need to, to shoot a matching element and we can recreate that camera position. It's imperative that a match mover from ILM be on set to take set measurements and Stupid place these track cool. markers. Uh, without a match mover, um, these track markers might not be in a shot and it'll be make it virtually impossible to recreate the camera move and to make a photorealistic environment. A day to shoot and probably for these shots, four or five months in post. Jeez. Once we get to, back to ILM, uh, John and I would meet and he and I'll just zip through the shots and I'll say, Okay, this shot's getting really close to animation, but I'm having some problems with getting the character interact with this table. Can you help out there? So there's a lot of back and forth. Now what do I do? I go to ILM every Tuesday and Thursday morning, <laughs> and I go over the work they're doing. Locked out. Even I can't get past the security. I go He's so over cool. the computer. Uh, the characters or the specific shots that they're working on. The, the real breakthroughs, I think, with ILM were to take the, the uh, strides and the uh, inventions that have been created over the years and then try to streamline them and make them less expensive. <laughs> you have no idea what some of these things can look like or some of these things will be. So you just kind of, you know, get out there and, and act like everything's normal. It's uh, it's challenging because there's nothing there, but it's like theater in that way, you know. Uh, it's very demanding on the imagination. I mean, when we started doing Star Wars, it was very hard to get a spaceship to fly and pan with it. Now it's just, we don't even think about it, it's so easy. With the new digital technology and everything, I'm pretty much, whatever I can imagine, I can do. Uh, there are very, very few limits. Because it's not really George Lucas, it's digital reconstruction of him. It's all magic. And then now we're at the Mando, and it's like you got screens encompassing everything, which, more about that soon. Um, all right, we're on the next one. Revin it to the next level. Sounds from a galaxy far away. Do you want that, or do you guys want... Should we just keep going in order? What do you guys feel like doing? Should we have jigsaw puzzle building model communities? And then, of course, we'll go to deleted scenes. I don't know if we'll get through all that today, but, um, whoops. what I just hit? Well, let's watch it. And Boba Fett appears as a cartoon character. I think that's his first, first appearance, just after 78. The uh, holiday special. I am Boba Fett. I think... A great deal of fans, 98% of fans, Fett, want man. to know more about him. Um, I grow up in four and five and that, and then I become a bounty hunter. Whoa, I even get the jetpacks. <laughs> much rain as we can get, as much wind as we can get. One of the great things about episode two is it really delivers on this mysterious and wonderful character, Boba Fett. And also someone who's equally uh, <laughs> mysterious, uh, the character called Django Fett. <laughs> it's more Morrison. I guess he's the original bounty hunter then. Yeah. Because Boba Fett's like 11 years old in this one. Come back on uh, Monday, I think, to fly the spaceships. Can you do that? Fly through asteroids, fight, shoot. Took him under my arm. Call me dad now while we're here. Okay, I'll call you son, you know, just so we get the bit of bonding going. Yeah, we just got to use our imaginations. Actually, I think this is what fans have been waiting for ever since they saw Boba Fett in The Empire Strikes Back. Bounty hunters. And the very first day was um, 
a scene with all the bounty hunters. And I really all I was doing was just standing and looking at Darth Vader occasionally. No disintegration. As you wish. I remember my younger son saying, um, isn't it funny you've put a bucket over your head, Dad, and, uh, you know, and people think you're rather cool. He's all yours, bounty hunter. It was very exciting because the first real science fiction film I'd done. Put Captain Solo in the cargo hold. Human, yes. Um, origin, unknown. Planet, unknown. He was quite a special character. It's the mystery behind this uniform. You need to see the film several times to think, why does he wear this death head on his epaulette? Uh, they had little knee pads where I could fire darts with. They were Velcroed on, and by the end of the day, they'd obviously slipped round, so you'd have to keep shifting them. And if I walked, which I didn't do much of, they'd shoot across the room because the Velcro <laughs> would snap off and fly. It wasn't easy. Well, this is from Empire, and there's Boba Fett on set. It's we're going to originals now. Down, and his trousers rolled up. <laughs> so when we first got the photos from the fitting and we put it next to, you know, put them next to one another, you could see who it was meant to be, yeah. but also you could see it was a different character, which is quite cool. They used the Boba Fett costume for my costume as well. May the force be with you, bro. <laughs> Can't wait to see him return, man, in Mando. It's gonna be amazing. We've gone for this new kind oh. of silver millennium. He's watching this. Like, feels amazing. reminds me of being a little kid. And, like, when the, the prequels were. Mental of the Boba Fett reign, you know? God, you just feel George, the energy. What's my lines today, George? Any dialogue? You draw your guns and you pow, pow, pow. The fight scene with Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> The space chase through the uh, asteroid planet. And the helmet, of course. And that got a bit, uh, a bit much in the rain sometimes. Believe me, this is rain. This is real rain. Drop cameras. Oh, wow. You know, while you're doing your action and your fight scenes. When the thing fogs up, I can't see anything. Oh, well, I'll just carry on like this. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see this blur coming down. Being a uh, strong, virile Maori warrior from New Zealand, well, you just got to deal with these elements and carry on. Thank goodness for those stunt doubles. <laughs> Good MC George, the director. Ask him about your motivation. I love Boba Fett. I mean, we get to spend a lot of time with him in this movie. We get to understand where he comes from, but we also understand that uh, we get to understand that his identity is forged in some of the most powerful events that take place in the whole Star Wars saga. But the biggest thing of all, he's, uh, he's pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> May the force be with me. What the? He can't do that. It's awesome. It's even more powerful than what we see um, in uh, Empire Strikes Back. I think it's uh, people are going to be blown away, not only by the costume, but by the performance and the whole overall um, story that takes place between Jango Fett and Boba Fett. I wouldn't rain up in space. <laughs> okay, which number did we hit? I, I can't even remember. Uh, we'll just go back. It's fine. Oh, we're at 10? Okay, so let's, we gotta go to 7. What's 11? Good to know. The Jedi Knights in action? <sighs> Wait. No, that's... This is 10. Okay, we gotta do 10 then. We have to do 10. I, we gotta watch that. Um, yes, more behind-the-scenes content. Make sure you make stuff like this for future films. For your future films so we can all look back and enjoy later on man uh definitely so i'm going to be hiring a few people for episode two and three um which will cover all behind the scenes stuff and i have a ton a ton a ton of footage from episode one i just haven't released it but i might do that for joint members i think that would be fun um i'll release the little bits here and there Three thousand viewers awesome guys thanks for joining in um this whole video is going to be copyrighted so it's totally fine i just want to enjoy it hang out with you all and um i didn't really want to edit so <laughs> Yeah, whatever. I'll do it live. It's more fun this way anyways. Few people highlight the talent of Hayden. He helped George bring Vader's past to life. Appreciate what you do. Keep it up. Awesome page. Uh, Dente, thank you for becoming a new member. Good morning from Western Australia. Good morning. Imagine if they had the tech we have today. Imagine if they had that for the originals. 
the fight scenes would have been completely different. Okay, let's let's do this one. Then we'll go back to seven and eight. Um, good to go. The Jedi Knights in action. I, I I'm very excited for this. This is the heyday, the golden age of Jedi that's, that exists in the world we have now. In episode two. I watched all these swashbuckling films all my life. You know, I was a huge uh, Errol Flynn fan when I was a kid. And this seems to be the next step in the fencing age. I mean, Jedi, as I've always said before, they've chosen a sword in a time of you know, laser guns, so they better be damn good with it. All right, all right. <laughs> good to G.O. All Jedi don't fight exactly alike. An elegant weapon. When we started, there was a particular style developed. It's um, a combination of samurai and Western sword fighting. And when we did Phantom, we sort of progressed that style. You know, Nick Gillard uh, creates a, a unique fighting style for each of the Jedi, and, and how it sort of reveals a certain element of their personality. Other Jedis have other ones, but that's, that's the one, isn't it? Yeah. And it's mine. You have to distinguish between the characters, so you, you have to read the script a lot of times and understand the character. A lot of the aggression that I hold in my character is exemplified in my fighting style. He just, he understands. You know, he moves really well, he's, he's tough. Anakin maybe loses control a little bit and some of the darkness emerges. Uh, whereas a Jedi normally would have to be much more in control of the situation. They're like marshals in the Old West. They're the keepers of the peace. They're given um, assignments to uh, resolve conflicts. This Jedi walks by and ruins my action. With the ultimate right. threat of force if things aren't resolved. I said, don't touch it. Yo, what? Anakin, um, who's much more youthful, and I think Obi-Wan Kenobi's slightly uh, more sedate. Right, oh, sorry, sorry, George. He's much more confident now. He's 10 years or so past, I think. He's become the master, not the apprentice anymore. Obi-Wan, uh, his fighting style is much more by the book, uh, even though he's obviously uh, very skilled. He has got extraordinary balance and hand-eye coordination. But yeah, it's a long process, and not just them getting the moves, but them keeping the character. Getting the feet right and getting the steps so you can actually do it. It's a lot like dance choreography. Uh, your feet have to be right so that the strikes look correct. <laughs> trying to go much more classical. You know, some of the characters are, are real master swordsmen, better than anything we've seen so far. <sighs> Excellent. I'm trying to figure out who we had to talk to about your light color, your lightsaber color. Oh, well, good guys are, good guys are green and blue, bad guys are red. That's just the way it works. No purple left? You might get purple. <laughs> That's cool, man. It would be a shame for me to participate in a film like this and never get to use my lightsaber. We've not seen Mace fight yet, and we know that he's second only to Yoda. Good to G.O. I guess because I'm such a fan of uh, Japanese samurai movies, and I watched a lot of... Uh, kendo fights and a lot of stuff. I'm doing pretty good at it. I was thinking about a style <laughs> for him, but it's Sam Jackson style, you know, that he has so much style of his own. Since I'm supposedly the second baddest person in the universe, uh, I'm pretty efficient. I don't do a lot of uh, fancy sword twirling or anything. I, I dispense people pretty quickly. Use as little energy as possible, but I'm pretty lethal. Okay, cool with that? <laughs> this is the first time that we really get to see all the Jedi in action, uh, which is an amazing sight. 
This is why I love but these are bonus tests. You using on the end there? Yeah, yeah with him. Are you making him flop around like a dead fish? No. That say you go in the mic. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's his own thing. It's gas. <laughs> This is awesome, guys. I love this. This is so cool. Okay, let's go back to number seven, right? That's what we were on. The wardrobe. Oh, no, wait. That would be the next one, I guess. Revenant to the next level. Sounds from a galaxy far, far away. We'll just finish this whole thing today, okay? So in this stream, we're just going to finish the whole thing. All right? Let's, uh, let's get to it. Imagine if they had the... Yeah. Welcome, Zach. Thank you so much. Third man told you that they shot episode three scenes back when they filmed episode two. I remember these web documentaries so well. They got me through wait between episode two and three. Man, the wait I remember the waits between two and three. Between one, two, and three. It was like three years each. It was a crazy long time. Uh, I think there's a great deal in the psychological effect of a movie that comes from the soundtrack. So for me, the sound is very, very important. It's half the movie. I've always had the uh, sound signer working on the picture from the very beginning. Ben Burt created the sound for the laser sword that really affected how I approached the laser sword fight. Fantasy like Star Wars uh, requires the complete uh, fabrication of a complete sound world from footsteps to exploding space stations. Ben's sounds, they're really unique and he has just a great library of sound that he's worked with and great experience. It's the voice of General Grievous, of by the way. The artistic development of sound. Matthew Wood worked on episode one, setting up the whole sound design workstation that, uh, that I was to use. He was uh, my mentor and teacher to get me started. As I, Rip Van Winkle, woke up in the future and sound had gone from the Moviola analog audio to the Pro Tools and being digital. I provide him raw sound effects elements. We're revving it to the next level with the film. Let's do it with sound, too. This is the only flying example of a Vickers Femi in the world. This was uh, the B-1 bomber of World War I. Ben has a huge amount of plane recordings, and a lot of those plane recordings have actually ended up as spacecraft in the Star Wars universe. Just wanted to get it. He knew it was something unique that didn't exist everywhere. I just have all the, the major parts of the movie in my mind and what we need to record and what elements I can provide for Ben. Pretty amazing, huh? I'll get a, a takeoff and landing. And then I also want just a couple of buys. So while I'm there, if you, you know, maybe just one or two, just like going by me and then a circle. Could we do that? You know, you're going over me so I can get the Doppler effect of the, you know. Okay. Check, 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 check. It's uh, totally unique. They've got this <coughs> giant wood propeller, so hopefully they're going to oscillate in some way that's going to Jeez, man. sound unique. I'll try to get as many different types of sounds that it makes. That's amazing. That's why it and sounds like that. All these metal struts that. here will be dragging in the wind. That'll, that can make a nice sound. If I just stayed at those fence posts and walk about, you said, a mile out there? A mile, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brakes work on this thing now? Yeah, they do. Sure. Brakes work good. Are we ready? Anything unique, anything unique we can get for the Star Wars movie. Hey, are we in a good location? I don't want to get him like right when he's leaving the ground. thing about this airplane, it's the first airplane to fly across the Atlantic Ocean nonstop, first airplane to fly from England to Australia, and the first airplane to fly from England uh, to South Africa. It does have a really interesting sound. It's like a giant car. the best sounds are not things that you think of uh, and imagine and then go out and search it reminds for, me of Django's rather shit discoveries slave unique. one sound is happening all the time so <laughs> just edited like um, but a lot actually of no obi one in that scene cool. I'd say with the seismic charges the basic things that you always like need that. to record especially for the Star Wars movies are like uh, 
You need vehicles, you need pass-bys. You know, it might be the bass sound, it might be Obi-Wan ship. No one was really gonna be able to identify it as a, as a plane, especially after Ben gets done tweaking it out. <coughs> end result of a motion picture is a great combination of picture and sound working together to most effectively and dramatically tell the story. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. That really, I got a really interesting sound out of there, and we're definitely, I, it's going to end up in the film, I bet. Cool. So I think movies are the most uh, artistic form of expression in the world because everyone comes in there with different backgrounds, like... Um, whatever it is, you know, sound, uh, artistry, um, writing, everything. And they all just mesh together and it, it's like a beautiful product. It's cool. Uh, building model communities. Should we do that one or should we do skip over to um, the wardrobe of Padme? What do we got here? Creating the action in the gene. Oh, I want to see that right now. We're in the middle of this giant execution arena where there's thousands and thousands of Genossians cheering and screaming as they are Genossians. led to the wolves. Okay, I'm never going to say Genossian again. It's Genossian now. <laughs> Genossians. You're trapped in an impossible situation with no means of escape. Well, the arena scene in the picture starts out as an execution, uh, and then it turns into a giant battle with Jedi. And then uh, that turns into the Clone War. Real six, as we call it. <laughs> there are only 100 Jedi available, and most of them were at Jedi resorts, where we go and rest. We had to call them out. <laughs> <laughs> There's 200 Jedi Knights who have flooded into the arena fighting on the arena ground. To create that scene, we're filming each Jedi one at a time with two different cameras so we can actually take the part of that fight that we like and then we can actually composite them all together in one big fight where there'll be a hundred of them all together in one shot. A lot of it is that more than any other kind of movie, this depends on trust. Yeah. And if you don't quite know what's happening, you get, especially actors, get very nervous. Mm -hmm. you know, especially when there's nothing to hang on to. And I don't even know everything that's going to be there until I actually start working on it. It really is like a giant sketchbook, giving more of a, like a poetic, just general swath of the, you know, what is the feeling, the mood, the lighting, color, palette of the location. The, the whole world of Geonosis is a combination of a kind of organic designed environment with a kind of tinge of industrial design in it. Through the notes and direction and, and George's sort of trust in us exploring things, literally in the doodle sketchbook phase, we can quickly leap from a a verbal concept to these color abstracts. George really was into the, um, these termite-inspired towers as if uh, you know, they're great architects in the natural world. So by bringing in these tower elements, um, carving into the rocks, it shows an ancient society, a very insect-like and very primal. Hoggle is something a little bit tougher than the average. Uh, Geonosian. George presented them as a species that could just sort of disappear into the rock. These ideas provide an inspiration and a conversation point for our meetings with George. Once we've had those conversations about the Clone War, we're basically everything in the movie's covered. Yeah. And we're in it, in everything. There's nothing sort of sitting on the shore anymore. 
it was a giant arena where there was an execution, so it was very much, you know, like a Roman Colosseum in that guise of a spectator sport. We built this huge stadium. During the ground battle, we'll use this. It'll be photographed and then replicated over and over again to help create the Geonosian landscape. I think the camera move is going to start somewhere in here and use this corner as if the gunships have come out. They're coming around here, they're heading that way, and they're kind of flying past this piece so the camera will come across this way. Bad <laughs> A whole reel. The ability to be able to take anything that you can imagine and turn it into a completely photorealistic event where you can comp in any actor and it's seamless is really the dream that all of us have. It's, it's his point of view, so the camera okay. would be right there. You see this edge. Pretty tight then, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's kind of, sort of a waist shot. Yeah, okay. Shoot that, then we have a geography of what it is we're looking at in terms of backgrounds and whatnot. It's a giant exercise in having a vivid imagination. And the effect of a thousand screaming termites, yeah. Yeah. that helps. We've got match moves that have come from the plates that they shot on live action. I can now key out the blue and then see what our characters look like when I'm first lining up the shot. So that as we pan or tilt or slide across the background, it's gonna match exactly what the characters are doing. Now we get a lot of close-up shots, and so we found that it would be faster if we just split the entire arena in half, and then have one crew doing the opposite direction of the other crew. And that way we can get more stuff into post faster and get those shots coming out. I think is probably the largest action sequence we have ever tried to even contemplate, uh, much less achieve. Uh, um, we're very, very excited about it. It is so big. Whether there'll be anything quite on this level in terms of a real six in the next film, but you know, it'll be more like uh, Empire, where it's you know, mostly just personal rather than grandiose. That's what you said last time. Well, I said, well, I said this is a love story, and it's not a... Yeah, so there's going to be lots of visual effects this time, because it's, it's a love story. I lied, didn't I? It's so cool. George is like a master of filming those little models, hey? Is he really good at that? Um, so we got, I think, one more left here. One or two more, I think. Um... Building model communities. We just did that one. I think we got Padme's left. Right? We did that one. Yeah, we did that one. It's just Padme's. Yeah, wardrobe. Padme's wardrobe. There we go. Did you know Padme's handmaidens were like actual assassins? They were like ninjas. They're In crazy. Star Wars, the first trilogy, Princess Leia's costumes are very, very simplistic. They're designed to not call attention to themselves. The Empire has uh, taken over. Uh, fashion has gone out the window. Everybody wears gray or white in a world where evil sort of is in control of things. And in the second trilogy, the costumes are designed to call attention to themselves. So it's just the opposite. Tone it down. As I write the script, I work with a design group. I mean, this might be okay for Padme. And cut. Pretty much as I write scenes, I say, okay, I got a scene here. What's that? In a romantic location on a lake, and it's gonna be a love scene and that kind of thing, so I need an outfit to, to go with that. As George sort of progressed with the script, he sort of realized more that he wanted to show a softer, sort of friendlier side to, to Padme. The other costumes in the first film really were about her being a queen. In episode one, she was a very formal figure and had to always be aware of her position. Last time they were so incredibly gorgeous, but it really cumbersome to wear. 
This one is much more about making her as beautiful as we possibly can. That's beautiful. And when Trish comes in, uh, a lot of things get thrown up because she then takes those and tries to translate those into real cloth and movement on, on the body and everything. They specifically worked hard to make them as comfortable as possible, and I really got to enjoy wearing these gorgeous, gorgeous clothes. It's very good. That's fantastic. Isn't that fun? Which one is, what is this um, for? This is packing in the apartment. Packing? <laughs> you got it just like that to pack? <laughs> <laughs> Every day I'm in a different outfit. <laughs> Big job. Natalie no longer plays the queen. She's now a senator. So the costumes are, are less regal and less formal and less stylized. Why don't we put a t-shirt on her? How's that? OK. My costumes are a little bit more revealing this time, no. much more feminine, not as rigid. Just to be a more casual, softer figure this time. Now this is um, P19, which Padme wears um, when she goes on a picnic uh, up to the shack fields with Hayden from the uh, retreat island. You know, she is going to fall in love. The costume in the <laughs> hills in a village so really, really beautiful. It felt like a period piece as opposed to, you know, this futuristic piece, but it's very oh, romantic and um, flowing. This has all been embroidered, and we've laid on the little pieces of uh, roses onto the bodice. Just Natalie to make Portman was this is a little shawl that gets straight to the crush. shoulders, and then there's twists of coloured ribbons in, in matching colours, light, summery, but quite sort of fun. So she can run about the fields and the dress floats. <laughs> and then, sort of with the hair, I think we made it very Star Warsy. But that was great. We have a much more romantic story, so that Padme's costumes are obviously more sultry in nature and, you know, revealing and pretty. There's one costume that George designed himself. <laughs> and that was sort of the costume that, you know, I came on set and everyone was like, oh. <laughs> that was an interesting costume to wear. And it was really hard at the end of the day because the corset was so tight, they made my waist like 20 inches or something. I didn't know George designed that. That's so funny, it's dude. It's a great way that George sort of portrays women. They can be powerful, and they can be soft, and they can wear beautiful clothes, and, and that doesn't contradict her strength. I think that's great with this character. Yes. She's this, like, tough, yes. smart woman that everyone's trying to kill because she's such a powerful leader, and she also wears the coolest clothes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. As Dumbledore said, it is not the clothes that make us powerful. It is our choices. No, I didn't say that. But um, I think either we, we got all of them, right? All 12? We're good? Yeah. A little bit out of order. But I think uh, we got the gist of it. Guys, I would love to make this more of a live stream series. I think it would be really fun. Um, let me turn regular chat back on so I can see what you guys are all saying. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. After this, we're going to go to, uh, where are we going here? Main menu. We could do documentaries. We could do uh, featurettes. No, we, we just did. Did we do featurettes? No. We didn't do featurettes yet. We didn't do featurettes yet. Um, story, love, action. So, okay. So, the next stream, we're going to cover these three. And uh, these are going to be longer I think, and uh, they're going to be more, they're not going to be as clustered with like different things, such as like garments and such, and let me see a story and like Hayden's, you know, audition tape and all that. But I feel like we're going to get a whole bunch of different things. And th mind you, this is only episode two, you know, this is just episode two bonus disc. We got episode one, three, four, five, and six left. So it's going to be a long process. It's going to be super fun. And uh, I hope you guys are excited. We could do maybe like a schedule for them where you can all tune in. So I'm thinking maybe, you know, we could do Thursday nights again or something. Or I'll just randomly come on stream and go live again. And uh, uh, if you're here, you're here. And if you're not, then you'll watch it later on. And, um, yeah, dude, I really enjoy these a lot. Let's see what else we got here. We got uh, deleted scenes. 
something else I could also do, I could also upload them without myself. So just uh, by themselves. Play scene with intro. Oh, cool. Padme addresses the Senate. So we got all these different deleted scenes here. There's one of the documentaries. From puppets to pixels, state of the art, the pre visualization of episode two. Cool. Tons of stuff we can do, man. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Um, glad these films are getting well deserved love. Definitely. Uh, cancel Kathleen Kennedy says Jedi Luke. John says, uh, you know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see Dave Filoni taking Kathleen Kennedy's place. I think that's what I'd, I'd really enjoy that. Um, okay, now let's watch them again. <laughs> I watched all three prequel documentaries literally like two days ago. Right on, man. Well, going to be watching it again. Uh, join me on the gaming channel. We're going to be playing Ghost of Tsushima Part 6. And um, that's all I have for today. Hope you enjoyed it. We might do it tomorrow. We might do it a few days from now. I'm not really sure. We'll see how it goes. Love you all. I don't want to bore you all with like just the same old thing. I want to throw some lore and fan fictions and stuff in there. Once Upon a Theory is coming in the next few days. Um, for join members, thank you guys so much. John, thank you. And, um, yeah, that's it. I'm out. See you guys.